the consumption of low-calorie sweeteners, largely based on observational data, have been linked to a variety of adverse health outcomes. And while there's been several different mechanisms proposed to explain these associations, one that's gained a lot of attention recently has to do with the gut microbiome. And so this headline is one that I find a little bit humorous just because it's quite vague in the statement, artificial sweeteners may change our gut bacteria in dangerous ways. And so what we're debating today is whether this um, is legitimate or whether um, this perhaps is, is alarming without cause. So again, the question that we're addressing is, do these low calorie sweeteners, which are all different compounds, do these affect the gut microbiota and how, and how does that affect um, clinical health outcomes? So this is not a, I think that there might be an issue with my slides. Um, okay, but that's okay. So this is not a new question um, because this has been well known in the dental literature for quite some time that low calorie sweeteners inhibit the growth of pathogens in the oral cavity. And so the dentists love low calorie sweeteners because they're linked with prevention of dental caries. And so it's not a surprise that there's um, interest in whether these sweeteners also affect the growth of bacteria in our gastrointestinal tract. So before moving forward, it's important to point out um, that these low calorie sweeteners are all different compounds. And what you can see here are a variety of different compounds um, that all have different chemical structures. And so while these are all sweet tasting um, and all are used as replacements for, um, for added sugars in the diet, these are unique compounds with different physical and chemical properties. So looking at how these low calorie sweeteners actually act in the body in terms of their um, digestion, their, or their absorption, metabolism, excretion, these are all different. And so here on the top left is acylphane, potassium, and saccharin. Both of these sweeteners are 100% absorbed um, and enter into the body, um, are detectable in the circulation, and are then excreted unchanged. Whereas aspartame um, is degraded rapidly upon ingestion. So it's immediately degraded into its constituent amino acids, phenylalanine and aspartate. And then that, therefore, it's not detectable in the circulation and it wouldn't be expected to make it to the GI tract. Stevia, um, and there's a variety of different stevia glycosides, is um, converted to steviol in the large intestine and then is metabolized in the liver, whereas sucralose has very limited bioavailability. Only 10 to 20% of sucralose is absorbed, um, and then it is either excreted in the feces if it's not absorbed um, or excreted in the urine unchanged. So given that these are all different compounds, we would expect that the extent to which they would interact with the microbes in the gut would differ. And so this is not a new question. Um, this is data um, that was published by Susan Schiffman group, Sh Susan Schiffman's group in 2008, um, quite a bit uh, old now. Um, but basically this was using crude data, just looking at bacterial counts and showing that the counts of various bacteria decreased with 12 weeks of sucralose exposure. And so these were several different doses of sucralose. The top line was the control. The other ones were all the sucralose um, containing exposures and showed this reduction in various bacterial species. But despite this, that this has been you know, a topic of interest for over 10 years, there's very few human studies that have investigated this question. And so the majority of what I'll focus on today is looking at data from the rodent literature. So I apologize, but I think this must be the wrong version of my slides because these are all in the wrong order. Um, so that's why I'm a little uh, tripped up here, but I'm not sure how this happened. I guess I can just keep going. Yeah, okay. All right, so we'll start with the human data, which is exactly the opposite of what I had planned to do. I must, must have uploaded the, long, the wrong version. Um, so there's very limited human data to address this question. And so this was a study that was published by the Suez Group out of Israel, um, where they had um, a very small interventional component and then a larger, random, um, a larger observational component. So they looked at 172 individuals based on whether they consumed or not, and then again, they did this very small intervention study. So in terms of the observational data, um, they looked at this cross-sectionally, 
and reported that there were significant positive correlations between multiple taxonomic entities and the consumption of low-calorie sweeteners. So they call them NAS, which is non-caloric artificial sweeteners. And then they also um, looked at hemoglobin A1C levels and reported that those, the 40 or so people who consumed low-calorie sweeteners um, had higher levels, higher hemoglobin A1C. And so they concluded that perhaps, given these correlations and given that they were independent of BMI, that this could um, therefore be consistent with what some of the rodent data show, which I'll show you in a minute. But of course, this is observational. There's been other studies of well, as well that have come up with similar conclusions. So this is the interventional part of this, um, this trial where they only had seven people, um, very, very small study. They administered saccharin at the level of the acceptable daily intake, five milligrams per kilogram, to these seven individuals, um, so over the course of a week. And they then characterized them as responders and non-responders. So responders being those that had an elevation in glucose tolerance um, or, or that showed elevated glucose levels post-oral glucose tolerance test. And then the non-responders were ones that had no change. So basically, of the seven people, four responded, three did not. And so they called them responders and non-responders. And they also assessed their microbial composition um, and concluded that the non-responders had different microbial composition compared to the responders. However, they also had different microbiome composition prior to the intervention. So this was used to basically support the rodent data, which are more robust. And then what they also did to look again at this question of microbiome is they did a fecal transplant experiment where they took microbiota from responders and non-responders and transplanted it into germ-free mice. And what they reported was that, again, this was only two responders and two non-responders, so very preliminary data. Um, but what they, they reported is that those, um, the, the mice that received microbiota from responders also developed relative glucose intolerance, so they had higher glucose excursions to an oral glucose tolerance test, whereas the germ-free mice that received microbiota from non-responders did not have any change in glucose tolerance. So this was just used to kind of support the hypothesis that perhaps this change in glucose tolerance is mediated by changes in the gut microbiome. So in terms of the human studies, um, there's very few studies that have assessed the effects of low-calorie sweeteners on the gut microbiome. Um, those that have been conducted are observational. I gave you one example, but there are others, but these are all cross-sectional. And so the extent to which these are applicable um, is unclear. And um, there's really a need to translate the findings that are in rodent models into the context of human consumption. So looking at the rodent literature, um, there's been a few studies that have been published. This is the one by the Suez group, the same group that reported the human findings um, that has probably gotten the most attention as of recent. And what they did, they did a few different things. The first was that they exposed mice to 11 weeks of exposure to various low-calorie sweeteners, including sucralose and aspartame, as well as saccharin. But the findings were most robust with saccharin, and so that's what was focused on in the paper. So they exposed these mice to saccharin for 11 weeks, and then they did the same thing, but administered the saccharin or the controls, which were glucose or water, along with antibiotics. And then they did a third experiment where they took microbiota from saccharin or water or glucose exposed mice and transplanted them into germ-free recipients. So in terms of um, the first part of the experiment with just comparing the glycemic responses after either saccharin or glucose. Um, what you can see there in the blue are the results for the saccharin exposed mice, in the black, the glucose exposed mice. And you can see that in response to an oral glucose tolerance test after 11 weeks of saccharin exposure, the rodents that had been exposed to saccharin had elevated glycemic responses compared to the rodents that were exposed to glucose. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, um, you can see that they did, a, again, similar, similar experiment, but in the red is when the saccharin or water or glucose was administered along with antibiotics. And what you can see there is that the effect disappeared, right? So there was elevated glycemic response um, post-OGTT in the saccharin-exposed mice compared to the water-exposed mice before when antibiotics were not concomitantly administered. And then when antibiotics were administered, then this effect went away, which led them to hypothesize that this, again, could be due to changes in the gut microbiome. 
So then what they did is the fecal transplant experiment um, where they took microbiota from saccharin-exposed mice or from glucose or water-exposed mice and transplanted them into germ-free recipients. And what you can see here on the screen are the glycemic responses post-oral glucose tolerance test of the recipients. So these are not the rodents that consume saccharin themselves, but rodents that received microbiota from saccharin or glucose or water-exposed mice. And again, you see similar results, which are that the rodents who received microbiota from the saccharin-exposed mice had um, elevated glycemic responses. And this, again, was supporting their hypothesis, this line of, of evidence that perhaps low-calorie sweeteners change the gut microbiome, and then those changes in gut microbiome mediate um, the onset of glucose intolerance. So there's been another study um, that did a very similar experiment, but with aspartame. And this one actually was published very close um, in time to the Suez paper. And so this one used aspartame, and there were four conditions. These were mice that um, had eight weeks of exposure to either a standard chow diet or a high-fat diet, plus or minus aspartame. So they either had high-fat with aspartame, high-fat with water, chow with aspartame, or chow with water. And the, um, on aspartame, what they concluded was, despite the fact that the animals consumed fewer calories and had, um, that they had higher body fat, but then in terms of the microbiota um, and glucose homeostasis, they had higher fasting glucose and impaired responses to an insulin tolerance test. And so when they um, looked at this in terms of which you know, microbes changed, they found that there were increases in microbes that have been previously associated with insulin resistance and also microbes that are um, known to produce short-chain fatty acids. And specifically, if you look at the right side of this graph, um, there was a disproportionate increase in propionate. And propionate um, is a glucogenic substrate, and so that's a hypothesis, is that this increase in propionate-producing bacteria may lead to increased gluconeogenesis, therefore um, predisposing these rodents to develop glucose intolerance. And also, there's been other hypotheses that have to do with energy harvest and more short-chain fatty acids potentially causing more energy that wouldn't have been accessible to become accessible. Okay. So there's also been a few other studies with other low-calorie sweeteners. Um, I won't go into detail on, on these, but this was a study by um, the Beyond group that was published last year looking at sucralose, um, also had a met metabolomics component and basically showed differences, but the differences in the groups um, really weren't consistent. They also showed differences um, between, the, um, between the males and females. So they saw changes, they've reported changes, but these really weren't consistent in terms of their direction. Also with sucralose, there was a recent study that came out um, reporting that gut microbiome changes in rodents that are predisposed to developing Crohn's disease. Um, this came out just a couple months ago, that sucralose may exacerbate this through changes in the gut microbiome. Again, very preliminary, hasn't been um, confirmed, but was an interesting paper nonetheless. And then for acesulfame potassium, the same Beyond group in 2017 published a paper that ACE-K altered the gut microbiome in a gender-specific manner, again showed differences in males and females, where the changes were observed in males, but really not in females. And so, um, I, again, I apologize that these are not the correct version of my slides, or I would go into more detail on these specific findings. So to summarize in terms of the rodent data, um, there's been several studies in rodents that have shown that chronic exposure to various low-calorie sweeteners, whether that's sucralose, saccharin, aspartame, or acesulfame potassium, that this alters the gut microbiome. But what the findings show in terms of which communities actually change and what the clinical implications of these changing are, changes are is highly variable. And also, it's important to note that these alterations are typically observed at high doses. Um, these are often um, administered at the ADI, if not higher, which is a level that is the maximum that humans could you know, consume on a daily basis that would still believe to not have any adverse effects. But this is, you know, five milligrams per kilogram of saccharin is not something that most humans would consume unless you're drinking six cans of diet soda every single day. And other low-calorie sweeteners have much higher ADIs compared to sucralose or saccharin. <clears throat> 
So the question really is, how do we translate these rodent data into humans, right? There are some data in rodents that, um, you know, the Suez study in the rodent component was quite robust, but how this works in humans, we just don't have enough data to say at this point. Um, there haven't been long-term, well-controlled studies in humans looking at this in a systematic manner. It's also important to recognize that we don't ingest low-calorie sweeteners by themselves. So when we talk about effects of low-calorie sweeteners on the gut microbiome, there's other components of these foods um, that need to be considered, right? So we're not just having sucralose. Even if we have Splenda, we're not just having sucralose. There's maltodextrin or other you know, bulking agents in there. And so when we think about the food, we have to think about the food matrix and not just the sweeteners by themselves. And also, the gut microbiome area in terms of diet and microbiome is rapidly evolving, right? So even, you know, there's still very much higher level questions that don't have to do with specific ingredients in relation to how the diet affects the microbiome and then how changes in the gut microbiome affect health. Um, and so, you know, when we ask the questions of low-calorie sweeteners and we observe changes, even if there are changes, we still need to fully understand what those changes mean and what is the implication for health and are these clinically relevant um, health outcomes that, were, that are changing. So in conclusion, several studies have documented um, low-calorie sweetener-induced changes in the rodent gut microbiome, and these changes may impact host metabolism, but these findings have yet to be confirmed in humans. And the extent to which low-calorie sweetener-induced changes in the gut microbiome influences human health requires further study in prospective well-designed trials. And so in terms of future research needs, um, we have to evaluate the mechanisms um, that may be driving these changes. So for example, when we talk about aspartame in particular, because aspartame is, is hydrolyzed um, immediately upon ingestion, how does that actually affect the gut microbiome? So there's a lot of questions that we need to ask. We also need to understand, do um, changes in the fecal samples, right, the microbiota in fecal samples, does that really reflect what's going on more proximally in the gut? And do uh, concentrations of short-chain fatty acids that we measure in fecal samples, do those reflect what's actually being absorbed, you know, because those are absorbed in the intestine, does that reflect what's actually um, clinically relevant? And so there's still a lot of questions in this field that need to be addressed before we can conclude that these changes are meaningful and we have to show that they actually affect health. And I know that's going to be John's position is who cares if they don't affect health, right? So we need to investigate um, whether certain individuals are more susceptible and also whether these changes, regardless of what the changes are, if they have clinically relevant effects on human health. So I apologize for my slides and thank you.